Welcome to Fantastic Descriptions, a YouTube channel where we do a deep dive into narrative storytelling for DMs and GMs of role-playing games. I'm Neil Aiken, and I'm a published author of two books of poetry, one of which won the Philip Levine Prize back in 2007. I'm also the translator of uh, contemporary Chinese poetry, editor of a literary journal, um, and a former computer games programmer. Um, and not only that, I'm a gamer. I grew up uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons, um, started with the original red box um, basic rules in the early 80s, early mid 80s, and pretty much played every edition um, since then, um, all the way through to the current fifth edition. And I love the game, I really do. Um, I love the game not just because of the tactical wargaming side of things or the puzzle oriented aspects of it, um, I love the game because of the worlds in which we build and inhabit um, collectively, collaboratively, um, as players and as game masters. And I am particularly fascinated uh, with the role of language in building these things in the in the minds and in the 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 hearts of the, our players. Um, a, a good game master can, with very little. Um, transform a space, um, whether physically in front of us or mentally in our minds, um, and make it feel alive and real. Um, and that's that's something I really have thought a lot about too, is, is really that, that despite sort of the advent of like more miniatures and battle maps and virtual tabletops and 3D printed terrain and all these other fantastic technological advances, at its heart, a role-playing game is still really about story and it's about how it's told and i think a good story requires memorable characters interesting challenges strong sense of place and some sort of emotional and narrative arc that we want to feel like we're actually getting somewhere and so for all the things that we buy make or use to make our games feel more immersive perhaps what we're really longing for is a better grasp on narrative description the fundamental component of theater theater of the mind style play so i should know i'm not really arguing that we abandon miniatures and terrain or give up on all these other cool and often very useful technological advances um i for one am a huge fan of terrain crafting i do follow black magic craft and and dungeon craft and bards craft and a lot of other um you know fantastic uh terrain crafting youtubers um because there's something that I really enjoy both on the crafting side and also that moment of wonder when you place it on the table and your players go, whoa, what's that? You built an entire Viking ship or whatever it is. Um, I, I really find that, you know, there's a great moment in that uh, exchange. But I also feel that, um, if anything, the last uh, few weeks of, of being... Um, uh, physically separated from from our players um, and uh, and running a lot of online games has taught me that there's a dependence we can build on a lot of these uh, a lot of these tools and a lot of these the the extra material that we rely on um, this reliance sometimes distracts us from the fact that a good story is still a good story and we don't always need all these other pieces to make um, an enjoyable game um, so um, I also want to point out that this this is not intended to the series isn't really intended to to replace um, a lot of the great uh, work that's already been done on uh, we'll call it sort of the mechanical side and the the uh, I think there's there's like work that's done by Matt Mercer and Matt Colville and Guy of um, How to Be a Great Game Master and Monarchs Factory and um, was d20 and and there's like a lot of other ones out there that do a great job of addressing different issues around like how to run a game or how to incorporate different elements into the game um i think there there's like technical mechanical um strategic aspects of of what they're covering that are all very valuable and probably go beyond really what i'm interested in doing in this channel what i'm interested in doing in this channel is getting back to the roots um, to, to ask questions about like what it is that we do when we narrate a story, um, where we create a scene or describe a monster or a villain, or um, even how to make like the description of combat more engaging without becoming ponderous and difficult 
to follow. Um, you know, we want to feel like that action is happening, but we don't want to feel like we're getting a, um, you know, a, a play by play in which it, it's just really an inventory of, of like vocabulary words um, about specific body parts or, or it just it lacks some sort of um, enjoyment to listen to or to participate in. Um, so there's no, there's no dearth of tips and training and tutorials on how to improve um, on these aspects of things. But I, where I think there's a lack is addressing how do we become better at the narrative storytelling, the narrative description side of things. Um, where it does show up, I, I find that the advice is good, but often barely scrapes the surface or ends up being, well, in my game, I do this and doesn't really address, you know, the principles behind it. Why does this particular approach work? Um, why does this other approach not work? Um, just delving a little deeper. So I think there's a, I think usually what you'll end up hearing is some mixture of these things. So people will tell you that you need to engage your senses uh, more than just sight. Um, and I think this is a great piece of advice. I think we need to give our players sounds and smells and textures and other things that give them an awareness of like their full immersion in the world. Uh, I think that's, that's good. Um, I think being strategic about that, being thoughtful about what's actually happening and which senses we use and when that I think is a step further in which we often don't get a discussion about. And I hope to address that. Well, I plan to address that in, a, in an upcoming video. Um, I think number two is we, um, we could, you know, the, the invitation to build our vocabulary is a good one. I think we should definitely, you know, do what we can to expand our ability to describe um, by just reading a lot of books and we can spend more time reading fantasy books. We can read historical books. We can study the fields, um, of which we're trying to describe. I think this is all like helpful to some degree so that we can, in our mind, have a better sense of the relationship between things and how we would we describe these things. But there's also a sort of strategy there that I think we can, we can delve into as to like why certain moments require us to use specific language and other moments that type of professional or field specific jargon might not make sense um, in game um, and being careful about what we're doing there. Um, number three, I think uh, like it is really great advice to go out and be a part of a lot of other um, games. If you are primarily the, the dungeon master or game master um, and you never have the experience of sitting in on someone else's game, then the only style of um, game mastering that you're familiar with, or probably styles, plural, that you're familiar with, are your own and what you might watch on YouTube um, or listen to on a podcast. And even then, what you're getting in those settings is an edited, um, refined version of it, often by people who view their role as professionals um, and maybe have spent maybe I've spent considerable time invested in, in, in just running games. And if you are beginning, or if you feel like there is uh, something that um, you've always done in a particular way and you haven't seen it done any other way, you may not really know any other options um, that are available. Um, so I, I think like advice to play in a lot of games is excellent. Um, but at the same time, if we're in a lot of games and we still don't know what we're looking for, it may not be as helpful as we would like it to be. So I'm going to talk about that. How do we make that experience of um, playing in a lot of games more meaningful? How can we learn from, from the people that we're watching or we're playing with? Um, fourth, uh, like show um, if you can't tell, which is basically to say, like, if you feel that you are not very good at description, um, sometimes the advice is that you should just incorporate more visual elements into the game or more auditory elements. So you like play background music if you want to emphasize or the dramatic moment or the particular turn of events. Um, how do you heighten that sort of sense of, uh, you know, the battle intensity or sort of a sense of betrayal or even a romantic moment? Um, I think that can be helpful, but it can also be gimmicky. And so I, I tend to favor being more judicious and careful with that. Um, I think all these different props, like, like I said, I like making my own terrain sometimes. 
Um, I think these, these things can be helpful, um, but they don't displace the need for us to actually develop um, a better ability to describe. And I think like our players will definitely appreciate if we can accompany um, even those props with description and take them to the next level. Um, and the final piece of advice is that we're not all going to be Matt Mercer or some other professional GM or DM that we've been following. Um, they've been doing it for years. They've been refining their craft. Often they come from acting or improv backgrounds um, and have cultivated sort of a, a wide variety of voices, mannerisms. They, they know exactly how to shift between these different things and keep them somewhat straight in game. As with the case with any expert though, there is sometimes a gap between the knowledge and expertise of the expert and their ability to communicate that knowledge and expertise to, to someone else who's new to their field. Um, I think this is a real issue, real challenge that uh, oftentimes uh, people who are have spent so much time invested and practiced in their particular area of expertise may become um, unaware of how to, you know, how much of a gap there really exists and, uh, or have forgotten what it's like to be at the beginning. And in some cases we may simply be, you know, um, ignorant of the, of the gap uh, altogether. I, I think uh, with the native speakers of English, for instance, we, uh, we forget that there are so many rules of language that we've internalized that were never taught to us. Um, like we know, for instance, that, you know, the order of adjectives you know, there's an order to adjectives, a preference for where things belong, and no one ever teaches us that. We know that we would say it's a big brown bear as opposed to a brown big bear. Why? Why, why is one order better than the other? Um, no one sits down and teaches us that, but we have internalized that. And then when we go to teach English to someone who is a non-English speaker, and they say it's a brown big bear, and we tell them it's wrong, and they ask us why it's wrong, we don't know how to explain it. We just know in our gut that you don't say brown big bear. You say brown, yeah, you say, you don't say brown big bear, you say big brown bear. Um, the same thing happens, I think, with, with dungeon mastering, game mastering, narrative storytelling and description is that we may have an intuitive sense of why something like we, we will say like, oh, this is the way that I would describe it. But we may not necessarily know the deeper why for why that's the case. Um, and I think sometimes it, it just pays to really dig up that and make sense of it, internalize it. And then we can be on the next step as well. So I, I guess we, what I want to wrap up here with is basically to say that as is the case with anything that we need to improve in or want to improve in, there are three things, absolutely three things we need to know. Uh, one is we need to know what it is that we're doing that's actually working. Um, I think we, we generally have a sense of that. Number two is we need to know what we're doing that's not working. And that's a little bit harder to admit. Uh, sometimes we just don't have enough information. We can't compare it. Sometimes we just feel that something is off, um, but we might not know what it is. And, and number three is, is really um, why. We need to know why that's the case. Why is something working and why is something not working? Um, we may know that it's working, we just don't know why. Um, and we may know that something's not working, but we may not know the, the reality of it, what, what's at the root of it. Um, I, I think it's one thing, it's just like when I was working as a computer games programmer, it's like, it's pretty immediate, you know, the feedback you get when you're, you're programming games. Um, you can usually tell right away when something doesn't compile and you can tell something when it throws a fault and the program just dies in the middle of it. And you like say, well, clearly that's not working, but what is going on behind the scenes down in the depths of the code that's making that not work. That's where you have to spend the time. And as you sort that out and make sense of it, and you might discover, oh, there's something here I didn't understand that um, I thought was a small thing, but turns out to have rather large, significant problems. Or there's a gap in my logic here that creates a situation that I didn't intend. Um, 
these type of things. And I think when it comes to narrative storytelling, it's the same way. It's like, why is it that our combat slow down, bog down? I'm, aren't I including enough, you know, have I been including enough detail in my description of the combat? Why does it still not feel compelling or interesting? Um, or maybe I'm like, I've been introduced like these critical hit and critical miss charts. I think this, this will make excite, make it much more exciting and compelling. And yet somehow I feel like it's, it's not, um, you know, my players are still distracted. They're still not invested or I, I'm finding myself disconnected from the combat now in a way that I didn't anticipate. So I think these are, these are things to address. So once more, it's like what it is that we're doing that's working, what it is that we're doing that's not working, and why this is the case. So um, <clears throat> I think, you know, as we learn these things, as we make sense of these things, um, it's possible for every one of us uh, to gain a general competence and confidence in describing people, places, and things. Um, that the worlds that we're describing will become more real and uh, more capable of being imagined by our players. It's not to say that we have to be masters of these skills and techniques. I think even gaining some greater understanding of one or two of these things that I'm going to be talking about over the next few videos, these things can make a dramatic, huge improvement in the quality of narration and the confidence that you feel and your players feel about what's being described. So my goal for Fantastic Descriptions is to dig below the surface and really explore how we can use language more effectively to describe the world in compelling detail while also bringing our players deeper into the world of imagination. I'll be drawing on my own studies in poetry, psycholinguistics, phenomenology, literary theory of other sorts, film theory, cinematography, spoken word performance, just a variety of things that I've encountered over the years, which have helped me understand what it is that we do when we narrate a scene, create part of the world in the minds and the ears of our players. Um, so my hope is that we can draw on these things and that I'll be pulling from literature, I'll be pulling from critical theory, and I'll be pulling from role-playing game texts, um, as well as creating some guidelines and tools and resources that will help you and help me become better storytellers. Uh, my goal isn't necessarily to, um, uh, to replace the wide variety of resources um, that are out there. I think there's, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, I hope that I'm adding something new to the ecosystem um, and making, uh, you know, offering something to the world of gaming that um, has given so much already to me. And so I look forward to hearing from you if there are particular topics or challenges or concerns that you have as you've set out to try to describe different parts of your game or different parts of the world to your players. I'd love to hear that. I'd love to hear that in the comments. Um, please subscribe. I'll be back um, hopefully at least once or twice a week with a new video. Um, probably not as long as this one. And, um, and I'll try to keep it a little bit more focused. But thank you for listening and thank you for being a part of this great adventure. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye.